Hello, my name is Joanne Banks and I'm a lecturer in inclusive education at the School of Education in Trinity College and you're all very, very welcome here today. Um, uh, we're delighted to be hosting this public lecture here in the school uh, and the title is Generating Momentum Across Campuses Using Universal Design for Learning to Create a Common Discourse and the lecture has been given by Dr. Frederick Fauvet uh, from Royal Roads University in British Columbia and we're delighted to have him here today and we're equally delighted to be working in collaboration with the Ireland Canada University Foundation so uh, it's lovely to, to have you uh, here today. Um, I just a little bit of context from, from my point of view, but also from the school and from the Irish context for those of you not from Ireland. Uh, we're at a really crucial point when it comes to inclusive education in the country and conversations and debates are, are really ongoing uh, as to how we can achieve inclusive education from preschool right through to further and higher education. So this lecture comes at a really um, pertinent time in, in, in the Irish development of inclusive education. We really look forward to seeing how frameworks like universal design for learning can help us achieve that goal of inclusive education where all students can gain access uh, to education in their, in their local uh, educational setting, whatever age they might be. So just to go over the format today, um, as I said, I'm going to chair the, the session. I'm uh, then the, uh, going to hand over to Dr. Rachel Hoare. Uh, Dr. Rachel Hoare is a project director in a Trinity Inclusive Curriculum Project, and she's going to speak with you for a minute about that project and, and the context for that. Uh, Rachel's then going to hand over to James Kelly. He's CEO of the Irish Canada University Foundation. And James is then going to introduce uh, Frederick to begin his lecture. Um, so Rachel, I'm going to hand over to you uh, and maybe you could uh, let everybody know about the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum Project. Thanks a million Joanne. Hello everybody. So as Joanne said my name is Dr Rachel Hoare. Um, I'm based in the School of Languages, Literatures and Cultures here in Trinity College and I'm delighted to be here this evening in my role as the Undergraduate Director of the Inclusive Curriculum Project here in Trinity College which kicked off um, last October. Um, firstly, I'd love to welcome Frederick and to thank the School of Education here in Trinity College and in particular Joanne Banks um, for hosting this event. And I really just wanted to kind of take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about our new inclusive curriculum project. Um, so here in Trinity, we, we recognise our own curriculum, our modules and our programmes aren't always as inclusive to all students as they should be. So we've set up this inclusive curriculum project and that sits within the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Unit in Trinity, which is headed up by the Associate Vice Provost for um, EDI, Professor Clodagh Brook. Um, and our project is going to draw on student experiences of inclusion and exclusion, um, as well as the many different fields of expertise in this area, which we, we find amongst staff members in Trinity and also experts from outside of Trinity, such as Frederick. Um, to help us to inform and motivate our academic staff on how they can be more inclusive in the ways in which they teach and the ways in which they include students more generally um, and to ensure that the students who they find in front of them are well represented within the curriculum. So how will the project work? work? Well, as I've already said, um, it started in October 2020 and we are a team of four. Myself as undergraduate director, we've got a postgraduate director project manager, and then we have a student partner, liaison and communications officer. Um, we've just completed the first round of recruitment of champions, of inclusive curricula champions for each of our 24 academic schools in Trinity. Um, and they will attend training and workshops in this area and disseminate information, raise awareness, and also stimulate open discussion and debate through their different schools committees. Um, we also have an advisory board, and I've already mentioned um, experts in the area from Trinity and beyond. And the idea is that we can consult with these um, with this board on a regular basis, individual members, um, and a very important, we also have a very important student partnership program, which is an initiative involving students from the nine grounds of equality and other key areas of student diversity. So these consultations with students and student groups on their lived experiences, and that's a very important aspect of it, that will all inform the inclusive curriculum training for academic staff. Um, we're very excited about the project and are delighted that as part of the project, Frederic will be fac facilitating smaller group workshops to help us to identify and work through some of the pertinent issues and challenges within the Trili Trinity context. So thanks for listening. And if you want to find out any more, then please just email trinityinc at tcd.ie. We'll put that in the chat. 
Um, and now I'm going to pass you over to James Kelly, who's the CEO, CEO even, of the Ireland Canada University Foundation. And um, I hope you all enjoy the lecture. Thanks very much. Thanks, James. Thank you, Rachel. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to say hello to everyone. Uh, um, it's my great pleasure to be here. It's great to hear that there are people uh, joining us, not just from around Dublin and Ireland, but different parts of the world. Um, that's, uh, it's always a bit hard to kind of get your head around that, but that's the world we're living in now. And that's, that's the really exciting aspect of these kinds of um, uh, events. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Ireland Canada University Foundation. Uh, it was founded uh, over 20 years ago uh, and with the aim of building connections between Canada and Ireland. Um, and we've awarded over 500 travel awards during this time, more or less equally to Canadians, supporting Canadian people, uh, researchers and academics coming to Ireland and supporting Irish uh, uh, researchers and academics uh, and learners going to to Canada. Um, and uh, it's not just about building connections, though. Um, we realise that, uh, that the world we're in, there's much that, that we need to be looking to achieve and support in terms of uh, our society and our planet. So we're looking um, to, in our foundation to support um, projects and people who are looking to make contributions to our society, not just in Ireland, and in Canada, well, that's important, but also what can we do for the global uh, society and looking at sustainability uh, issues in the planet. And uh, for this reason, we're really, really pleased to be supporting this fellowship. It addresses a really vitally important part of um, society, that of extending education to all. And um, so I would like to uh, congratulate Dr. Frederick Fauvet of Royal Roads University, British Columbia, on your fellowship. We were very, very pleased to be able to um, make this award to you. And I would also really like to thank um, Dr. Joanna Banks of the School of Education uh, and her team there, uh, and Rachel, of course, and Anne, who are helping out with this, for, for, for hosting this event and also for coming to us um, with this proposal. Um, so thank you. Thank you all. Um, as I mentioned, we've been supporting travel for, for many years, but we have also for years um, been looking to find ways in which we could build connections that weren't always reliant on fossil fuels. And we had been looking at online um, uh, options, but it's really only in the last year that this has become something that people are really um, uh, open to and organizations are open to and the world is open to. And that's why I'd like to just talk a little bit about this Beacon program. So the Beacon program is, uh, this is a Beacon lecture. We've given, uh, we've made awards to 18 Beacon, uh, Beacon Fellows this year. And uh, these are all being recorded uh, as is this and will be available for public viewing. And so the aim of this program in that respect is to share these lectures uh, with everyone who attends, but also online uh, for the coming weeks, months and years ahead in order to, to support this learning. Um, but, and actually I should say my colleague, Amanda Hopkins, I think is going to put a, a link in the chat uh, now. If you're interested in viewing this again or any other uh, of the Beacon lectures, uh, you can sign up through that link and we will, um, keep you up to date uh, or just feel free to take a look at our website to find out more uh, about what we're doing if, if you're interested. Um, another aspect of the Beacon program that's important uh, is besides this public event is that there will be a series uh, after every event there are uh, smaller follow-on smaller group meetings and that we see as a very important part of this uh, program that um, Dr. Fauvet will and will engage with um, Joanne and her team and her colleagues and uh, students over the coming weeks in smaller group settings and that allows for the development of uh, personal connections and friendships that we hope will uh, will bear fruit over the coming months and years and indeed 
could in fact, you know, lead to hopefully in the real world when we come out of all of the, the lockdown, that people will actually physically be able to meet each other. Um, so we're not, uh, you know, we're, we're fully aware that that is actually really at the heart of who we are as humans is connecting and meeting. And nonetheless, the program is a very exciting part of the picture, we think, the Beacon program. Um, and we'd like to thank our funders, the Irish government and the Canadian government for this, supporting this program. Now, uh, I think I have said just about everything that I wanted to say. Um, I'd like to thank you again, uh, Joanne and your team for applying. I'd like to um, uh, now uh, pass you over to Dr. Frederic, Frederic Fauvet. Um, and before doing so, just wish you the very best for this lecture and for the uh, events that follow and for no doubt the connections that you will build through this uh, and the fruit that these connections might bear over the coming uh, months and years. Okay, if I could call on you, um, Frederick, uh, to deliver a lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James, for the kind words. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the fellowship uh, and to the ICUF. Um, and also feel really honored because I have worked with, uh, with Ireland now for some years uh, through HEAD and, and through um, some of the Twitter chats organized as well when Joanna on the webinar series uh, and also I've been able to um, to host some uh, Irish scholars when I was organizing a conference at, at Royal Roads and I'm currently working on a book which involves a lot of, of uh, Irish scholars on UDL so I feel really that this crystallizes a lot of these efforts I'm, I'm very very grateful. I want to congratulate Joanne as well on uh, being a recipient alongside myself of, of the fellowship and to thanks uh, the School of Education at Trinity College Dublin for putting all the work as they actually had to put a lot more work into the application than I had. So I'm very, I'm very grateful for, for your time as well. So welcome to this session and the title today is Generating Momentum Towards Inclusion Across Campuses. Sorry, Sorry oh, Frederick, yeah. before you start, can I ask if closed captioning is appearing? For everyone, if, if uh, Rachel, yeah, is not there, that's fine. Sorry to interrupt you. That's right. Is it appearing when I'm speaking? Because I don't see mine, but uh, it, it's working too. Okay, super. Um, yeah, so the title today is Generating Momentum Towards Inclusion Across Campuses Using Universal Design for Learning to Create a Common Discourse. And I'll just say a couple of words here, uh, because really the purpose of, of, of a, a public lecture of this type within the fellowship is to really uh, meet a need. Uh, and so we're very um, happy that this really fits well into uh, the inclusive uh, curriculum project and, and kicks off some of that momentum. And hopefully I will be part, as Gemma said, in uh, some of the conversations that happen from, from here. Uh, Mary says it's not appearing when I speak, uh, Joanne, the, the captioning. Well, I don't think there's a huge amount I can do. It's obviously appearing for you, Rachel, you nodded. Um, I'll just stop share and just try it one more time. And then yeah. I'm afraid we'll just have to, uh, we'll have to make do, I'm afraid. Uh, maybe you could speak there for a second, Frederick. Yes, uh, let's, let's, uh, yeah, it's not appearing for me, so I don't know if it's, no. uh... Okay, so... apologies, everybody. Um, so we will just have to offer you closed captions on the recording of this. Um, we we uh, had intended to have closed capturing for the, the actual session itself, so apologies for that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure what happens there, but anyway, apologies, and we'll we'll try and uh, the best. Uh, it is a slide one I do discuss uh, alternate format, so you will see there's a lot of support material that goes along with the lecture as well, and hopefully um, people can rely on that as well as they move forward. Um, so yes, just a couple of words on the title itself. Uh, the intention was that we spoke for once about universal design for learning for the inclusion of all learners within higher education, and not necessarily have a a focus on disability. So I really welcome this opportunity to widen the, the discourse on UDL and, and hope that you'll find it uh, you know, interesting and engaging that there will be a lot of uh, dialogues em uh, emerging from this. So John, we'll go to the next slide just so I can do a language enlargement. So I had a little teething, teething the technical issues there because I don't have control of the panel. So I'd like to take a few minutes just to uh, make a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that Royal Woods um, sits on the land of the Kasopsum and the Congruent families and nation and communities that I also work, live and play on, on these lands. 
Um, it is important uh, that we make efforts, uh, particularly after the truth and reconciliation recommendations, um, that we make efforts to integrate uh, the ways of being, the ways of knowing of these communities into our teaching and learning and research. Um, efforts are being done, so that Royal Roads and across Canada, uh, but we have to be aware that these are only first steps and, and, and the road uh, lies ahead with a lot, more, a lot more work to be done on this. I acknowledge, I, I encourage you as well, since we are joining remotely today, for anyone who's living on the lands that have been occupied and used for since ancestral, ancestral times by indigenous communities to also take the time to acknowledge um, that they are using these lands uh, while they work and, and live. So welcome to the session, Joanne, we'll go to the next slide. Um, I also want to just give a, a few uh, words of acknowledgement. Already I thanked uh, the ICUF for uh, the fellowship. Uh, congratulate Joanne on being a recipient with me of the fellowship. As I said, this is the culmination of, uh, of almost five years of working in UDL, specifically with UDL uh, with colleagues in Ireland. So I'm really, really pleased and really honored by this and I hope it, it actually sets the stage for further collaboration and, and much more works in, in the years to come. We'll go to the next slide, Joanne, and I'll set the objectives for today. So the way I'm going to uh, approach this today is to really, first of all, take the time to look at the need. Why do we need to change what we do in higher education with regards to inclusion? I think a danger here is that often we jump straight into the solutions, but we don't take the time to look at the need. A lot of you I know today online are people who have to play the role of advocates with regards to inclusion. And I'd like you to think that before you even approach faculty and try to convince them of a need for a new framework or new practices, you need to spend the time to acknowledge that things are not working because that's the biggest motivation motivator of all. Once people realize that they can no longer carry on doing what they're doing the way they're doing it, that uh, opens the appetite for, for new solutions. So that's, that's the way I'm gonna approach it with you today. Then I'll introduce quickly UDL and clean up some of the haziness because it's a big concept now with lots of resources. So try and make it palatable and, you know, and, and easy, to, uh, easy to digest for, uh, for, uh, in, lay, in layperson terms for uh, the average practitioner who wants to explore this. Then I'll take some time to look at some of the successes that we've had in the last 10 years uh, on an international sort of scale, looking at uh, North America and Europe. And I'll finish off with looking at the challenges that still lie ahead. So some of the work that we still need to cover, uh, hopefully in the decade that, that comes along. And Joanne, we'll go to the next slide. In terms of the format of the session, it's I, I obviously as a UDL advocate always try and, and, and inject some UDL flavor into the presentation itself. You're gonna have to bear with me because this is not, uh, not great to do when you're doing things virtually from, from another country. I would be able to do a lot more if I were face to face with you. But there are some, uh, some steps I've taken. So first of all, um, I've created a website that accompanies the lecture. So you've got the, uh, you've got the, um, the link there. Maybe we can copy it into someone has, has got free hands, is able to copy it into the chat. It's probably gonna be helpful for people. Uh, that contains an extensive version of everything I'm going to I'm going to uh, discuss today. So really, we only have 45 minutes, but there's about 8,000 words and a full paper there, which is uh, follows the same the same uh, structure exactly and can be followed along, or, or you can return to it later. It also contains video summaries. Um, because all this has been quite rushed and most of it has been done this weekend, I've not had time to add the transcripts, but they will be added this week, so you will have transcripts for all the videos as well. Um, I also encourage you to use uh, the Twitter chat, which I've selected today as Darcy Majim Beacon. Uh, and then I can continue that conversations with you all day. Uh, you can include my Twitter feed, which is just um, double F O V E T as well, if you'd like to uh, from, from make sure it gets to me, but the, I will be checking the, the, uh, the hashtag all day. The PowerPoint therefore is a bit minimalist. I haven't put an awful lot of text on the PowerPoint because you have, as I said, the backup of the full text on the, on the website itself. And tonight, so tonight for you and a bit later for me, I will be sharing the PowerPoint itself on SlideShare. So again, if you go to uh, Twitter or you go to uh, my LinkedIn, you'll be able to access the, the slides right there if, you, if you're not done so already. So uh, also it's 45 minutes. Uh, I know the word public lecture also always assumes a sort of degree of formality, but please do jump in. There's a chat. We have a lot of people monitoring the chat and Joanne will interrupt me if there's key questions that I can take just in time. And then we'll have some more time towards the end of the lecture as well. And we're aiming for about 45 minutes. So we should be finished by six your time. And I will take some questions at that point. Okay, Joanne, we'll go to the next slide. So identifying the need, we're getting into the 
the heart of the subject there. As I said, it's really important that you take this step. I am, I've worked, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me. I've worked, uh, I've worn multiple hats. I've worked in accessibility services for four years. That was a job which I took on while I was doing my PhD. So I was head of accessibility at McGill. And within that portfolio, I was asked to develop UDL across campus. So I've had some direct uh, experiences of what it's like to, to face resistance, to talk to, to, to faculty, to try and convince people that this is a, a worthwhile framework to, uh, to engage with. And then I've been an assistant prof, now an associate professor. So I do a lot of reflection as well uh, in terms of autoethnography on the work that I do with UDL and some of the challenges which I face myself. And in both institutions I worked here, both at UPI and the Royal Roads, I have been uh, so academic lead at UPI and program head at Royal Roads, which means that I oversee, um, you know, 10 contractual instructors. Uh, and I, on a daily basis, I also have to have these conversations with them about what does inclusion mean? How can we, uh, you know, improve practices with regards to inclusion? and to sow the seeds of UDL and trying to, to, to engage them with UDL without being too forceful and too sort of top down in my approach. So I'll be pulling from all of these experiences in, in the talk today. So as I said, from all of these experiences, I really would stress the fact that we are in a very delicate position in higher ed and that um, there are a lot of forces at play. And as soon as you talk pedagogy and you try to be a little directive about what, um, you know, what should happen, you are gonna get some resistance. So it's very important that we look at, um, we look at the, um, the need first, because once you have colleagues acknowledging the need and acknowledging the fact that things are not working, they are gonna be motivated to look for, for solutions. So you have them in a, in a ready sort of psychological uh, framework then mindset that they will buy into what you are, what you are actually trying to discuss. So let's look at the need. And I've divided this up in two sections. First, looking at the need at the institutional level, so the macro level, and then we're gonna look at the need at the um, structure level, the, the micro level. The structures that are in place, uh, I write there, relate to a world that is no longer a reality. What do I mean by this? Well, if you look at our system of support, whether it's accessibility services, writing centers, individual support for international students, for, for first generation students, all of these supports have been created in the 1960s on the tail end of a civil rights movement, which was obviously laudable and has, has achieved great things. But that human rights approach has limits in a sense that really it's a world where universities and colleges were basically homogeneous environments. They were selective. Um, they were, you know, they were catering to a body that wasn't that diverse uh, on all on all sense in terms of gender, in terms of uh, you know socioeconomic uh, status, in terms of culture, indigeneity, uh, in in terms of uh, you know just about everything you know so, um, uh, sexual and and, uh, and gender identity as well. None of uh, of these issues really represented anything else than a minority concern. And in those days, it was really fairly easy to deal with minority concern in a one on one individual remediation position. So let's not change the structure. Sure. but let's provide supports that are able to do the one-on-one -on -one and support these students. If you look at the demographics of uh, higher education 50 years on, you know, 60 years on, um, that is no longer the picture. We have a body of uh, students, I'm going to argue, which for the majority is non-traditional. Now, I'm going to use quote air quotes for this because I hate the words, but we need to have a word that encapsulate this. So if we talk about non-traditional uh, students, I would say there's more than 50% of our students at the moment are non-traditional. So the reality has changed. How can you provide support for non-traditional students in an individual way if 50% of your population actually has specific needs? It's no longer viable, and I'll come back to that several times. Now, we do see a lot of EDI, so equity, diversity, inclusion efforts around the world in campuses at the moment, mostly as a reaction to the Me Too movement, to the Black Lives Matter movement that's really speeded up things, and it's very encouraging. But I would argue that if you look at EDI um, efforts around the world, they are not actually about pedagogy. They are about um, you know, social capital, social integration, well-being and health, uh, living conditions, but they don't actually tackle the classroom. They often fall short and don't quite there talk about pedagogy itself. So that's a, another reason why things are not really working at the moment. Then I argue that the vision of high diverse learners is misleading 
because we have overfragmented it, right? So instead of getting a, being aware of the enormity of the numbers and seeing that really, I would argue more than 50% now of students are non-traditional, because we cater for them through fragmented service provision, we are able to be distracted by the fact that, oh yes, there's a little group here that needs accessibility services, a little group here that needs cultural uh, you know, support, there's a little group here that needs international student support, another little group here that needs writing support. And we fragmented the services so much because that's how we work in higher education, we work in silos, that we are unable to see the momentum of what faces us, right? And that's a, a real problem because at one point, we need to acknowledge this is actually that inclusion now is a majority discourse. It's not a minority discourse anymore. So the very fragmentation of our services as is, is, is proving counterproductive in that respect. The other problem with that fragmentation and the service provision is that it is very difficult for any of the people at the moment providing support for students to actually be able to engage with faculty on a conversation about pedagogy. They are unable to do this because they feel hierarchically that it's not their place to actually discuss, you know, instruction design or assessment design with an instructor. Certainly accessibility, accessibility services personnel feel that, but I'm sure if you talk to international students or, you know, support officers, um, indigenous uh, student support officers in Canada and in North America, all of these people would say, I would never really dream of picking up the phone and talking to an instructor about pedagogy itself and the design itself of the classroom. And that's really problematic in the, in the structures we have. The biggest problem as well is that all of our support services are grounded in a def deficit model view. And what do I mean by deficit model view? Well, if you look at accessibility, it's easy to understand, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. We actually look at all non-traditional students from a deficit perspective. What do I mean by deficit model? Well, to summarize really the theory in, in a few words, uh, I've, I've put on a slide of the three characteristics, which I think are essential. We consider that that non-traditional student is lacking in something, lacking in skill, lacking in competency, lacking in cultural awareness, all of these things, lacking something. Then we decide that the intervention that's going to be able to address that lack happens outside the classroom, right, through support services. It's not actually dealt with by the instructor themselves. And... Um, and therefore, there is no, and that's the third difficult part, there's never a critical look at pedagogy because we really say there's a problem with the student, the students go somewhere else for support, and that's it, that gets dealt with outside the classroom. So it's missing that sort of retro fit, you know, retroactive uh, feedback to the instructor that in fact the problem might actually be the teaching and learning. It's not necessarily actually the, pro the student that's the problem. So this deficit model really is applied to international students, to indigenous students, to uh, you know, first generation students. It's not just uh, students with disabilities. It's actually wide, widespread within uh, higher education. I will go to the next slide, uh, Joanne. And this deficit model of interventions, as I said before, happens outside the classroom. And this, this creates a problem because if you look at the big picture of inclusion, there are many reasons why we justify inclusion as being worthwhile as an objective. Some are philosophical, some focus on social capital, some focus on the diversity of cognitive uh, learning itself. But two important parts are always social capital. If we continue to support these students from a deficit model perspective outside the classroom, we perpetuate stigmatization because every time a student is said, you need to go somewhere else to get the support you need, it stigmatizes them. And it hinders social capital because for social capital to be really developed, they need to be able to stay in their classroom and actually interact with all students in the same way at all times. So it's actually a, a, it is a very significant impact there on the ability of these students to actually benefit fully from their education in terms of social capital, because often there's that degree of stigmatization. And I, I draw a parallel there with what we used to say in the K-12, which was ability streaming. And that's still very much what we do in the post-secondary. Because when you tell a student, okay, you are in my classroom, something is not working, go somewhere else to get the, the support that you need, that is basically ability streaming. And that's what we continue to do in higher ed. Um, another problem is that these, uh, all these structures are not sustainable. And I've, so I've talked about the lack of sustainability before, um, but let's break it down a little bit. In terms of, first of all, services, those support services, as I said, were created in the 60s. They don't have the capacity to carry the demographics that we are now dealing with. So if you take accessibility services, for example, they are tracking at the seam, right? They can't actually um, you know, address the, the needs that are coming forward. You have huge backlogs, huge bottleneck and, and delays in accessing services, but it's the same for 
and support for international students, for writing centers across the world, which are completely overwhelmed. And that's really a, a characteristic of the bigger problem. Why are writing centers having to deal with, you know, so many issues that are really classroom issues and they're being sort of shifted onto a support service? It's not going to be su sustainable because these departments are cracking. If you talk to any of these services, they say we cannot carry on doing what we do in the way we're doing it. Um, sustainability financially at the institution, it's extremely costly. When I used to work at McGill, it's very easy for instructors to say, oh, well, they'll go and get retrofitting and access to build these services. When I left McGill, our annual budget was 1.2 million, right, for accommodations. That is non-sustainable development because every year, every semester, you carry on doing the same. In fact, you do more because there are more students requiring the services. It doesn't change the pedagogy. It's money spent that has no impact at all on our structures, which is it's just a phenomenal waste. It's like throwing money out the window, right? And nothing changes in terms of systemic, uh, system, systemic sort of structures. Then also keep in mind, that sustainability, and this is gonna be a good link to the next section, that sustainability is also about sustainability of uh, practices for teaching practices. If you look at the what most instructors report, they will say that they are overwhelmed by the number of specific requests which they get from students. They can't keep up with the number of uh, accommodations or other, um, you know, other, other needs that need to be addressed. You just use the word extension and most will then will shiver in fear because it's something that they have to deal with constantly, right? And it's, it's become part of the friction that they have within the classroom. So if you talk to instructors and faculty, they will actually say they don't either see themselves teaching in this way for the next five or 10 years. So there's a huge issue there with sustainability at all level. Now, if we go now to the micro level and look at, at instructors, it's problematic as well for instructors because we've discussed um, the accommodation model, which doesn't work uh, because it stigmatizes, because it's not sustainable and all these things. And the other, other available model for them at the moment is differentiation. But I have great reservations about differentiations in higher ed, because if you look back at Carol Tomlinson's, uh, you know, which was the advocate for differentiation, if you look at a model, she basically argues you walk into the classroom, you identify needs, you quickly do that juggling act where you create multiple pathways, you deliver those multiple pathways without changing your outcomes, and then you leave, and then you come back and you do it all again every day. Um, I, don't know any, I don't know any educators who are able to do that. Uh, unless they have 50 years of career experience and they actually have been trained as pedagogues. Differentiation is actually very complicated to do. It's extremely daunting. And at higher education level, a lot of instructors will say, I don't see the students long enough to identify the needs. I don't have the pedagogical skills to identify the needs. And even if I do identify the needs, I don't necessarily have the tools to create these multiple pathways in just-in-time fashion within my lecture. So uh, it's a big dead end as far as I can see, and really that's the only other option at the moment, and it's extremely problematic for, for faculty. So we've set, the, we've set the stage for the need, and now we're gonna go on to the next slide and look at how UDL might serve as a solution to the problems that we've identified. So first of all, what is UDL? And I think that's the biggest problem at the moment. People are starting to be a bit overwhelmed by the, num by the amount of resources that exist in terms of UDL. I think if you Google UDL, you're going to get over 2 million hits. So where do you start? And then there's all these different acronyms, you know, is UDI, IDU, all these sort of different versions, three block models, all sorts of things. So we have to come back to really layperson terms and try and make this palatable to instructors. How can we have a concise definition of what it means that is, over, that is all encompassing, but actually uh, um, easy enough to manipulate so that everyone can walk away with it as you are doing today and be able to use it. So I tend to say that it's a translation of the social model onto, into teaching practices. Now that you might say that's a bit daunting, but it's the best way I have it of keeping it simple. What do we mean by the social model? If you've not encountered that before, I'm going to explain it briefly. The social model of disability basically says that, um, you know, the disability isn't an inherent characteristic, it's not a label, it's not within the person, it's in, in the interaction between the person and the environment. So it's actually a friction between our various embodiments and the way we design products, services, experiences. And when this doesn't fit, that's where you have the feeling, the perception of being disabled, and that's where disability is, is situated. The point today is to move this away from disability. So some of you may not be comfortable with this notion of social model. I tend to even, you know, take away the of disability and talk about social model because I think it works for, for other, um, other uh, non-traditional students. But also in my uh, background previously, 
I used to work with changing behavior in schools and I used to use ecological theory and that's pretty much the same. So if you'd like to substitute ecological theory to social model, it's the same. In a sense, the social model, uh, sorry, ecological theory, when you see a manifestation of a problem in the classroom will really encourage you to think this isn't about the ch child, this isn't about the student, it's about my interaction with the student or, or the school's interaction with the students or the classroom's interaction with the students. So it's, they are both basically theories that see the problem as being trans, transactional, right? Transition, it's actually between interactionists. It's between the, the individual and the environment that the problem is, is located, located. Once you embrace that, it's extremely powerful because then you realize the problem is no longer the student, but the problem might actually be you and the way you do things and the way you design things. So it's, it's really a huge flip in professionals, the awareness of their practice that suddenly they realize, okay, there's an awful lot I can do. This isn't about the student. It's actually about me doing things differently. And so that's essentially what UDL is. It's about shifting away from that medical model and saying there's a, you know, there's a special need here, there's ex exceptionality here, there's something specific about it. And to accept that in fact, diversity is a given in any classroom and that therefore the, the problem will be you if you don't actually plan from that, for that diversity uh, proactively before you actually walk into a classroom. And that's basically all UDL is. So I tend to walk away from you know, the grids, the checklists, the templates, um, Yes, we'll talk about the three the three principles, but keep them as wide as possible because basically all they are they are um, three facets of the same um, the same process, which is design thinking, right? And design thinking means as a teacher putting on the hat and saying, "Yes, I design things," and the way I design things can can support students or can disable students, all students, and this isn't just about students with disability. Um, so why is it important? Because it shifts. Uh, so I should say a few words about those three principles if there are people watching this that have never been exposed to UDL at all. In terms of breaking this down, um, early advocates of UDL have argued that really it's still very difficult for an instructor to take on that hat and say, okay, I'm, I'm putting myself in a design, kind of, in design thinking kind of mode. So to help them, it's been divided in three. There are three different dimensions in which you design. You design the way that you provide information to the students, and that's called multiple means of representation because you're going to try and inject as much flexibility into that act. Then you are usually asking the students to also create content, messaging, contribute, participate. So they are creating content and you are going to want to inject as much flexibility in that. And that's the multiple means of action and expression. And then um, students also engage on an emotional level with what you teach, right? It's that effective connection, that emotional connection. And you're gonna to want to also include as much flexibility in that dimension of design. How do you design for engagement? How do you construct engagement? And that's the multiple means of engagement. So that's in a, in a nutshell, that's all you need to know about UDL and the rest kind of flows from your own reflection on your own practice. So how does it address the needs that we've seen before? It's a whole class approach. Uh, in the sense that you are no longer asking the students to go away and get support somewhere else. You are able to eliminate this reliance on all of these other support services. This can be very empowering for, for, for instructors. Um, just as an anecdote, when I started uh, working at McGill uh, in 2011, uh, we were hit by a general strike. Uh, I remember my boss said, oh yes, they mention strikes all the time, it never happens. Well, we did have a general strike for five months. So head of accessibility suddenly you have 10 staff you no longer have 10 staff you're just yourself because all support services have gone on strike for five months and you still have to carry on finals in a campus of 40,000 students so all i could do for these months was send an email to to, to instruct and saying we still have a legal obligation to do this i can't help you you're going to have to do it right and that's like all i did for, for four and five months basically and the wonderful thing is that after those five months they came back to me and said is that all you do and that wasn't offensive it was actually I can do this. I don't need someone to be doing this for me. I can actually do that reflection on delivery and assessment. I, and it was very, very empowering for them to, to go through that process. Uh, it's useful in any context. And I think that's the important thing. Once you shift away from the deficit model onto um, an analysis of the barriers, what we often call barriers analysis, you suddenly realize that the barriers that are uh, experienced by students with disabilities are exactly the same as the ones in, in, experienced by an international students, by a first generation students, by a first, you know, a second language speaker, uh, by a, a person who's challenged, uh, who's facing socioeconomic challenge. They will actually, in their discourse, actually highlight the very same points of fiction, the very same barriers. 
So once you shift away into that sort of design thinking and looking at the situation in terms of barriers, suddenly you're no longer fragmented. You can actually target the needs of all these students because they're actually facing the very similar barriers in the teaching and learning design. Um, I'm coming, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to try and make sure that I cover all this. Uh, some of this I'll probably cover a little quicker so we can actually go through everything. Um, it's a common discourse. This is important because, as I've said, there are many just justifications for inclusion and many different tools, all the way from personalized learning all the way to UDL. Even when we talk about, uh, and I'm sure it's something that, uh, you know, inclusive, Trinity inclusive design is facing as well. When we start this discussion, often people are not even talking about the same thing. So it's very important that we have a common discourse. And UDL, I, I, I argue, serves as this common discourse. It means you no longer have to talk theory, uh, justification, philosophy, authors, you know what you're talking about, you're approaching it from the same angle, you're able to get quickly into important conversations about how do we make this happen. It's not prescriptive, this is extremely important, because we have um, we have academic freedom in, in higher education, it's very difficult to tell someone top down in the directive way, you're going to teach this way, and it's a, it, we have to accept it, it's part of who we are, and that's part of how, what higher education is. UDL is great because it's it's not a checklist. It's not prescriptive, right? I would throw away all of these checklists that you see on these templates. Just keep the three principles of design and think, how does it apply to me? Who do I teach? What do I know? Where am I on this spectrum of inclusive design? Uh, and what can I do in this semester to improve things, right? It's a very palatable lens that anyone can take and make their own. So the result might be different. You might have a colleague who lands a very different design solution than you do, and that's totally fine. We're not trying to universalize the solution. We're trying to really get people to go deep into their practice and to come up with a way of continuously increasing the accessibility of their material to all. And that's something that everyone can do in their own way. Um, it's hands-on, it's user-friendly. That's really important because, as I said before, instructors find inclusion very daunting. You suddenly are putting this word, but they have these pictures, right? This mythical vision of all they have to do. If you look at UDL, it's actually something that's very hands-on. It's really much about, okay, what are you looking at? You're looking at instruction, right? Are you, which principle are you looking at? Okay, what do you do already? I do this. What could you do more? Okay, I can do this. So this semester, I'm going to do one little addition to my toolbox. And I will grow this toolbox progressively through my career. And I insist on that. It's not an overnight process. It's a lifelong look at your, at your, um, at your practice. It's something that follows you for the rest of your, of your career. And the last point, very quickly, it integrates with ease other varied scholarship. I think it's really a danger that we see UDL in a vacuum. UDL is not a vacuum. It's one of the many lenses that we apply to teaching. So we need to be able to have quick theoretical uh, bridges to constructivism, to social constructivism, to experiential learning, to critical pedagogy, and UDL does that. You're able to create this connection and see that it really, in many ways, it's a repackaging of things. It's not something new. It's not something out of the box. It's an easy vehicle for the things that we want faculty to focus on. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, Joanne. Um, so this will be quick and you can um, peruse the, the website if you'd like some more example, but I want you to stress some of the success that we've had with UDL in the recent years because faculty always want evidence-based uh, documentation that, you know, what has been done, what works, why should I do this? So it's important that you keep this on your radar and you're able to discuss this. Uh, so first of all, the explosion of UDL beyond disability, it's really, uh, you know, an outcome that's really observable everywhere now, particularly there's work done around indigenous students in North America and in Australia, uh, work done with international students. I've certainly written a chapter about the, the use of UDL uh, with international students. It's very relevant, works very well. Uh, the use of UDL with first generation students as well, that's very important because those often are, are the forgotten students in our systems, right? But if you look, for example, at further education colleges in Ireland and community colleges in North America, that's the students they're dealing with, right? They're on wide range of experiences, wide range of age. They haven't necessarily had any experience ever, even from a family perspective of what higher education is like. And there's a lot of very hands-on challenges that are there. UDL works really well from that. There's some really encouraging work around UDL and community colleges in North America. And then culturally diverse learners. There are some great emerging literature around uh, culture responsive pedagogy and UDL. And again, creating that bridge and showing that, yes, it's a, it's a tool that works really well for that as well. There's growth uh, in UDL in graduate education. That's taken a time because often people in graduate education tend to say, oh, well, it's, it's very small size anyway, so we don't need a framework for inclusion. It's all about personal relationship. 
They also argue that um, oh, the population is much more homogeneous because they've already gone through a cycle of higher education and you know they've got tools and strategies. Um, and what we see in practice, it's not that at all. There's a huge percentage of students with disabilities in graduate education. We know for a fact there's a huge percentage of international students because it's our market and we want graduate students to come from overseas. Um, there are still a lot of first generation students making it to graduate education. And the myth that it works better because you're in a small class size, well, all you need to do is look at the, the huge uh, literature on the tension that exists in supervision at graduate level to realize that it's not as easy as we say, and it's not as easy as we think. There are a lot of barriers there and UDL is very powerful. And that's starting to explode now, so it's great, it's great news. There's a growing interest for UDL in new sets of disciplines, and that's encouraging because so far a lot of it's been done in the lecture hall. But um, there are certain colleges now looking at uh, what do we, how do we do UDL in a in a visual arts studio, right? I have a I've worked with an institution in Canada that have said, well, we do we do studio critique. The students come in once a week and they present their piece and they sit around and do studio critique, and then they walk away and they come back next week with a different piece. How do we do UDL in that environment? I don't necessarily have the solutions, but it's encouraging that we see people starting to dribble down the principles into these, uh, these specific environment. Science labs are very particularly complicated because sometimes you have a manipulation of extremely dangerous material, you know, health and safety concerns. And so it's all very well to say it's yeah, all inclusive, but in fact, we need to see that in the nitty gritty of it, we actually need a framework. We need processes. We need to have a reflection from uh, you know, the lab technician or the instructor about how do we do that? And how can we be inclusive in UDL within environments that can be dangerous and involve a lot of, of uh, specific manipulation of equip equipment and material? Language classroom, um, there's a lot of work starting there. And the outside classroom and field placement, these are huge, huge environments because in higher ed, often we have practicum, we send students on experiences that are outside. So it's not just a matter of developing UDL within our own environment. We need to make sure that our partners that we work with also work from that, from that viewpoint. And that's starting to come up in, in the literature. Um, as I said before, there's also now a smooth connections happening with particularly critical pedagogy. If you work with a multiple means of engagement, really that connects perfectly with critical pedagogy. So UDL there and, and critical pedagogy are really cemented well cultural responsive teaching, constructives and social constructive, and a lot of experiential learning and active learning. And it's really important that we weave all this and it's happening at the moment. Then of course, we have to talk about uh, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. And that has been huge in my eyes because um, it, it's, it, you know, it was, I think people are still on both sides of the fence as to whether it's been a, a blessing in disguise or it's been the worst thing that's happened to higher education. I think we'll have to wait for the outcomes and wait for the literature to emerge. but. I think it's undeniable that it has pushed forward uh, important conversations around, um, you know, around uh, some of the difficulties that were there before COVID happened. Um, take assessment, for example, you know, some of the debacle that we've had in North America with people trying to do summative assessment from home and then crying that, you know, crying loud and, and, and that there's cheating and then having to try and proctor things virtually. And I think now people have had to, to, to go to that dead end and realize the failure of it all to realize that maybe the problem is my assessment. Maybe I shouldn't be doing summative assessment in a virtual environment. Maybe I should work to formative assessment. Maybe I need to redesign what I do. So I think it's been a very dynamic force that has shaken people out of their zone of comfort and made them realize that actually there were a lot of cracks in what we've been doing before uh, and that we can't play the ostrich anymore. We can't just pretend those problems are not there. Now, the problem with the, with the COVID-19 crisis is I think it is our responsibility collectively, and this would be a call for action for all of you online today, that we don't uh, forget the lessons that we've learned. I would argue that higher education is a, a landscape where we see an awful lot of pendulum swings, right? So we go one way and then we completely forget and we go the other way and we don't always learn from the lessons that the field is providing us. So I think it's important for all of us as advocates and scholars and practitioners that as, the, as we move away from the pandemic into the post-pandemic world, that we don't let go, that we keep people's awareness level about what was wrong, what you changed, what you've learned from this, what can you reintegrate into your practice so that we don't just swing back to the way we were doing things before. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. And I'm amazed, uh, even when I was preparing for this, to the, of the amount of literature already on UDL that's available in 2020 concerning pandemic uh, provision. So it's there. 
let's keep building this because it's going to be very, very important. In a way, whether it's been a godsend or not, it has provided a cathartic moment of realizing that we were doing things wrong. So how can we now that we've had an insight to how to then do them better, how can we keep that momentum going uh, and, keep, and keep learning from those lessons? So I'm very, I'm a word of encouragement and hope. I think that we are going to carry on uh, building there. Um, so looking at, I've got about five minutes to finish because I'm, I'm on time. I'm going to start and relax a little bit. Uh, looking at the challenges ahead, I think it would be wrong to think that because we've had successes, everything is going to be uh, easy from now on. I would preempt this and if I'd had uh, enough time, I would have included an image that I use sometimes, which is the, um, a base camp at the Everest. And I and put it up and I leave it there and people say, why do you have this up? And I said, well, that's where we are with inclusion, right? We we are so happy because when you're at base camp, you get to sleep, you sleep in your tent, you're so happy. And then you look in the distance and you've still got a huge peak that you have to climb. And that's exactly where we are now. So we both have to celebrate, but we have to keep in mind that we have a long way to go. And that's the point really of this lecture and of the way that, uh, of, the, of the process that Trinity College Dublin is engaging in. Um, first of all, we need to document what we do. What I'm finding at the moment is that there's an awful lot of missed opportunities because every campus, well, let's preempt this by saying we live in a neoliberal environment, right? Where every campus is seen as a competitor by others. So often instead of collaborating, we are very keen for our visibility and our branding on reinventing everything. So this, this lecture is a great example of what we need to do more is to share practices and to, to, to build and profit and benefit from that osmosis with other, other campuses. Because otherwise we're reinventing the wheel and we're wasting an awful lot of resources and time doing what other campuses have already done. Instead, we could be learning from these lessons and starting much further down the river and actually getting there much faster. So I encourage you all again, call to action, share your practices, share what you've done, publish. I know we're all overwhelmed. We don't always have time to publish, but we need that evidence-based literature out there to convince other campuses that the starting point is actually much further down. They don't need to go back and start where we started off. Um, also an urgency for um, literature around these specific settings, right? I've talked about the language class from the science lab, the field placement experiential setting. I see a lot of that because I'm a consultant and I work with a lot of institutions, but we need that literature to be out there. So, you know, I, the, the, the visual arts studio, for example, I'm encouraging to publish. I'm like, there's other people who are facing the same problem. And uh, once you finish that reflection, publish it. It's extreme, you know, it's building blocks and we're all gonna profit from this, from these building blocks. So we need a lot of action in the, like, in the next decade on, on, these, uh, on these fronts. The next point I had up was the need for core objective analysis as a precondition to UDL implementation. It's a simple sentence. I'm probably gonna spend the rest of my time on this because it's quite large. It's very difficult to have a discussion about inclusion uh, and UDL with a faculty member who hasn't actually had a deep reflection about what their core objectives are in their course or their program. What we're seeing out there is that once you talk about inclusion to most faculty or most departments, there's that fear, don't touch my curriculum, don't tell me to add flexibility, I'm not quite sure what I'm, what I'm teaching, what I'm assessing, so let's leave it this way. And, and, you know, and I'm one of those people, so I'm saying this in, with the biggest empathy. But it's very difficult to have these difficult conversations about inclusion and accessibility if you don't actually have precision in what you're doing. Um, when I've had great experiences talking easily to people about UDL that have never had any experience with it, it's because there were departments that had gone through a really deep work around the core objectives of their courses and the core objectives of their, of their programs. Once that was in place, it was very easy to talk about access accessibility because you can actually reassure them, I'm not gonna go and touch your core objectives. Those are yours. You have defined them, you have listed them. We don't need to touch them. They have to be demonstrated. They have to be taught, assessed, demonstrated. We won't go there. But that's a, a tiny little percent of what happens in the classroom. And for all the rest, we can actually inject flexibility. For all the rest, you can be as inclusive as you want because it doesn't affect your core objectives. So you see how it's liberating, but it's also very daunting because departments and instructors that have not gone through that reflection are really frozen in the headlights. They will not engage with you unless they've done that work. So I think as UDL advocates, we have to uh, preempt this with that discussion saying, have you thought about your core objectives and your core, you know, and done a core objective analysis? Is that transparent to your learner? Does everyone understand what the core objectives are? and the things that we're not touching and what, where else there's, free, there's uh, freedom and, 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 uh, and some flexibility. So that is extremely important. I really, in all my experiences with GL, I can tell you that that is usually really the, 
the key to it being implemented or nothing happening is whether that reflection has happened. And that actually has nothing to do with UDL. It has to do with departments and faculty actually looking at the, you know, the essence of what they are teaching and what they are assessing. And once clarity is there, the rest comes, comes in very easily. Um, we also need a solid scholarship around management of change and strategic implementation of UDL. I have three minutes to finish this. Um, we tend to be very happy because in the last decade we have done a lot of promotion around UDL is good because it has clear beneficial outcomes for, you know, pedagogical outcomes for learner. That's great. That selling point of saying this works from a pedagogical position is great, but it's not the end of the road. If you are a senior administration or you're a campus um, you know, unit manager, you want to know how you're going to uh, unfold this. How is it going to roll out in your institution? And that, and that has nothing to do with pedagogy. That has to do with strategic planning and management of change. We are not great in higher education at management of change. We like the wishful thinking, right? We have a policy, it's in place, tomorrow it's happening. Well, that does, that's not how management of change happens. So one of the challenges probably for, for Trinity Inclusive Curriculum is that it does mean um, a real deep reflection around who does what, who's responsible for what, who's going to oversee what, who, who monitors the process, who addresses resistance, who does that, and also who has ownership over uh, the model. Uh, it's great that we see 20, uh, 20 inclusive uh, curriculum being taken charge of it. In other campuses, there's still an awful lot of debate. Often it's thrown in the hands of accessibility services. It doesn't fit there. And I say this with a great deal of empathy. I was an accessibility you know, service director. Um, it's so, there's so much ambivalence within accessibility services. It's not the place for UDL to be positioned. Uh, you know, at the same time as these people are trying to advocate for UDL, they are stuck in provisions that are medical, medical model based. It doesn't work. There's an inherent contradiction. So teaching and learning services, I've talked about international student support, indigenous student support, all of these people need to be around the table. They need to be present if it's a committee, a round table, but the ownership needs to be discussed. And that's part of that management of change and strategic planning. I tend to argue as well that we need a theoretical lens for this. And I've talked about uh, ecology, but I like talking about ecology here too, not in the sense of the individual at the center of, you know, Bronfenbrenner's circles of systems, but place the unit in the middle of that. So there's more and more huge of ecological theory and organizational change. So if you decide that, for example, your teaching and learning unit is going to do the, is going to lead the drive, put them in the center and look at that schematic uh, representation. Who do they have alliances with? Who do they have uh, a lack of alliances with? That's all going to impact the way UDL gets promoted and unfolded. So that blueprint, that strategic reflection around, you know, who does what and how is this going to be led is very, very important. And that answers that last question, which I read top down or bottom up. People tend to ask me that as a consultant. Uh, there's no answer to that. That depends on, again, that blueprint. I think do that ecological mapping, look at who's leading the change, look at what systems you're dealing with, the in organizational culture, efforts that have existed previously. Once you've done all that, you will have a specific answer for your specific campus. It might be right to do it top down for you. It might be right for another campus to do it bottom up. That will, uh, that will uh, be informed by that ecological reflection on management of change. So that's very important to do. Uh, and then creating a common discourse, I think that's easy, I can finish that in one minute. I've said that it's a convenient framework for common discourse, but we still have to do a bit of tweaking, because if you look at UDL, it has emerged from disability, it has emerged from accessibility services. If you look at the wording, often it still refers to accessibility to disability services. If we want our colleagues international student service support, Indigenous support, libraries, all of these people to get on board, we have to tweak it in a way that the discourse isn't specific to disability. We have to reframe it slightly, as I've tried to do today, so that it's pal palatable for all, the, all of these uh, other stakeholders who will need to be able to use it and, you know, and, and, and also dribble it down within their units and talk about it with their service users. Um, so it's very important that we do that, that reframing work in the next decade that UDL isn't just about impairment and disability, it's actually about any diverse learner that is facing barriers in access to, to, to learn teaching and learning. And I will finish with that, I think, and spot on time, eh? I hope. <laughs> so here are my details there, don't forget, I will post a slide, so check on Twitter or LinkedIn on my profile, they will be up uh, later this afternoon or evening for you. And then we'll have the reporting up. And also you have that web that uh, website which I created for this, which carries the, the bulk of the rest of the uh, of the development of these ideas. Did we have questions, Joanne?
Yes, thank you so much, Frederick. That was great. And I can't see the attendees, but I suspect there was a lot of nodding going on with your uh, challenges and strategies to counter the challenges. I certainly uh, had a couple. <clears throat> I, uh, I wasn't able to view the questions as we went, but I'll take a look now if that's okay. Um, given the amount of change that we've all... Sorry, that just moved on me. Given the yeah, amount of change that we've all been through this year, what process do you see as effective in driving change when people are tired of change? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, and certainly the COVID-19 pandemic, as I said, can be seen as either a hindrance or a benefit to the process that we're trying to include to in engage in. But I think, um, again, yes, people are resistant to change. They're tired of change. They're tired also, let's admit it, of all these uh, um, sort of teaching and learning trends that are keep you know appearing and disappearing and so they, they a lot of people will say I'm going to put my head down because this will just go away right so how do we convince them that this will not go away I think it's a matter of prioritizing right a sort of hierarchy of needs and as I've started I've spent 15 minutes saying there's a need here if you get people to acknowledge the fact that they cannot carry on doing what they're doing you know, it's their own exhaustion, both at an institutional level and at a personal level. They have no choice but to look for a solution. And then that's where you approach them with a solution. And you have to do it in a very sort of light way as well. I don't, you know, force feed UDL. In a way, everything I've discussed today, I could frame it in another way. I just think it's a convenient framework that carries a lot of things that has been in the literature for decades, but it makes it palatable in, an, in lame person terms to someone who doesn't necessarily have the time to go and do all that reading and get immersed into pedagogy. So I would say, take it back to that need. When I used to work in accessibility, when I work with faculty, if you sit people down and say, can you, can you think of the, can you even imagine the, doing your job the way you're doing in nine, five years? I can tell you that I've never had anyone say, yes, I can actually imagine it, whether it's faculty or support services. Everyone is exhausted and one's at the cracking point saying it doesn't work. So if it doesn't work and you get people to acknowledge that, it's very freeing then to say, okay, I need a solution because I can't carry on doing what I'm doing now. I mean, talk about, seriously, I have a discussion with any faculty about the amount of requests for extensions, bombardment of emails about things that are not working in their course, uh, you know, people open, overly opening to them about the sort of difficulties that they are facing in terms of inclusion. All of these things become extremely stressful. Um, you know, that's the relief that you have when you have a faculty that tries a few UDL tips and comes back to you and say, oh my God, I don't have to have this discussion. Suddenly I can focus on my job because I've thought about this at the planning level and I walk into the classroom and it's done. I'll give you a little tip because sometimes it's really important because we've talked about big ideas, but people need to have a sense of what it means. So when I've supported faculty sometimes, I say, well, how do you do UDL with deadlines? For example, I still have deadlines. I still have assignments due. How do you do UDL? And so a, a, um, so a tip or strategy that some of the faculties I've supported have come up with is to have this sort of bank, bank of grace period days. So they, in their course outline, they actually say, you have all these deadlines, you have all this submission uh, sort of timeline, but you have seven days of grace period. You can not use it. You can use it if you wish. You can use it on one assignment. You can spread it around and use it as you wish. See, that's a very easy UDL tip. That certainly means that you will not have these emails, you will not have these phone calls, you will not have these frustrated students crying at your door. You don't need to be intrusive. You don't need to understand why they use it. Suddenly you, you know, addressing inclusion from all of these learners and you can focus on your job and you feel more job satisfaction from not having to put out these fires continually, right? So UDL is gonna be a series of tips like this that by doing a slight tweak into your practices at all levels and continuing to do it all the time, suddenly you are easing the pressure on yourself. And I think everyone buys into that. That's the selling point. Really. Um, okay, we have a question and it refers to something you, you talked about in your challenges, but how do we support and encourage people to walk the walk rather than talk the talk when it comes to integrating UDL principles? Do you have any advice on how to move beyond tokenistic or lip service engagement with UDL and the discourse around inclusivity more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's always a danger at, at all level, whatever whatever model you're talking about when inclusion that we play lips, it's easy to play lip service and then not do what we do, right? But I think uh, it UDL has the, um, the advantage of, of enabling anyone to position themselves on that spectrum because that's what UDL is, right? You're not non-UDL or UDL. You are somewhere on the spectrum. So usually when you start a, a session with faculty is to already position themselves on what do they do that actually already falls within that framework, within that approach. That makes them feel good. 
And then you can show that actually it's not, uh, it's not again an overnight massive redesign. It's what could you do? What could you one little step further next semester? Integrate one more thing with regards to assessment, one more thing with regards to delivery. And then you try that and you get that motivation from the learner saying, I really like this. This is massively important for me. And that becomes the instructor's motivation factor to try again and try one more thing the next semester. That's the great thing about UDL is again, it's a lens on your practice. It's lifelong. It doesn't have to be an abrupt change in what you do. It can though, though by trying it, you get that sort of, you know, uh, stick and carrot. You try it, you get the feedback from learners. This is working, or you can see also that it's working because you have less, less frustration from the learner. That encourages you to try one more thing. And that progression can carry on over years, over your career. So I think that's the way to move away from the lip service. If people are only doing lip services because they're scared, they're worried, they don't know which end to start with. Usually that's a problem. Everyone wants to do it. Most people I've met want to be more inclusive, but they don't necessarily know how. So again, we're back here to the common sense, user-friendly framework. It doesn't require an awful lot from you. It just requires that you try one thing and then you're willing next semester to try another thing. And that in itself becomes a snowball effect. That means that you are then enticed into it and you, you get your kicks out of the result and you want to try further. And I think that's, from my experience, that works. Okay, you're okay to take another question or two, yeah, Frederick, okay. yeah. Um, could you speak a little bit more about the ecological analysis or the blueprint that institution needs to carry out and what does this process look like? Absolutely. Uh, so first of all, the reason for that ecological um, outline, um, when you work as a consultant, you have an awful lot of institutions calling you in and they, you know, they want you to come in for two days and they say, okay, tell us what to do. Right. It's a lens on practice. So I'm never going to be able to tell you what to do. That's why that ecological blueprint is required. Um, and they will have a specific question. Again, top down, bottom up, do I do this? Do I, where do I start? The same way that in the classroom, one size fits all does not work. At a macro level, one size fits all doesn't work in UDL implementation as well. There's no shortcut there. You are going to need to do an analysis of where am I? You have institutions that have already started the journey. They don't need to start again from scratch. Um, they may have, have already specific allies within a campus that are able to take this on and to drive it. Then you're going to be working with those. Uh, you may have a community of practice that's already existing and that has great outcome. You're going to need to work on how you integrate them and how they can be important in spreading uh, the message. So the notion of ecological theory is to realize that, first of all, in higher education is a complex landscape. I keep saying it's complex, multi-layered. We come from different backgrounds. We have different training. We have different theoretical stance. So you've got to acknowledge that complexity. No simple solution is going to work. That's why an ecological um, sort of lens is important. Once you identify where do I want to start, what has already happened, where do we, you know, what are we building on, and you uh, decide on the ownership, who takes this on? Is it a committee? Is it a roundtable? Is it uh, teaching and learning? You know, is it uh, Trinity Inclusive as you've done at Trinity College Dublin? Once you've decided that, you place them at the middle of this ecological representation and you can actually map out, again, the allies that they have, the departments that they have difficulties with. Let's be frank, often it's about politics. It's not about the content of change, it's about politics. Once you understand the politics of all these systems and how they fit, it enables you to tackle proactively things that might not be working, uh, to work, uh, optimize from a strength-based perspective the alliances that you have and, and the connections that you have. And then you can draw out a strategic plan looking at uh, you know, five years ahead or 10 years ahead as to how you're going to do this. So it enables you to suddenly say, we're going to work on the strengths that we have. Again, from a strength perspective, we're going to tackle proactively some of the resistance we have within with certain units and certain departments. It's going to really draw your own map of how does it happen and what, you know, and what can, and, and how does it move forward? Um, again, politics is important. And that's been a problem, for example, with placing this with accessibility services. We haven't acknowledged that accessibility services have already got a very stressful relationship with a lot of stakeholders on campus. So suddenly you're asking them to be advocates, right? And, and ambassadors of something. So the content itself becomes rejected, not because of that, but because a lot of the will say, you're accessibility, don't tell us how to do this. You know, you're accessibility, we don't, you know, we, you don't have the hierarchical status to tell us how to do that. I think we, we are sometimes very naive in higher education. We have to acknowledge the complexity of that landscape. Once we, accept, we acknowledge it and we accept it, we can literally map it out and the way ecological theory becomes useful. And we can use that, that, that schematic representation to know what we have to do for the years to come. And that is different from campus to campus because you're looking at size, history, organizational structure, key 
you know, key personnel that are present and are either facilitating this or not, all this needs to be mapped out on that blueprint. And that's what gives you the keys to how to move forward. Amazing, Frederick. That's really, really great. I think we could probably go on for the evening or the morning in your case, but I think we'll we'll leave it at that. I just really want to say thanks for your contribution. Um, I also would really encourage our, our listeners here uh, this evening to go to the website that you created for this specifically for this lecture if they feel they haven't quite got their question out or they haven't gotten fully um, everything that they wanted. So thank you very much. I'd also like to say thanks to uh, James Kelly and Amanda Hopkins for their support in the Irish Canada University Foundation. And from my own perspective, I really want to thank um, the School of Education uh, and uh, Trinity Inclusive Curriculum for their um, moral and technical support at times this evening. Uh, really, really appreciate it. I think that was a, a very successful uh, lecture. So, so thanks again. And I'd, I'd like to say goodbye to everybody. Thanks, everyone, again. And again, I'm very grateful for all the support from everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.